Hey, this is Molly. Before I introduce you to today's guests, I want to share some exciting news. My new book, Fearless at Work, is officially hitting stores on April 7th. We all have fear, but my inspiration in writing this book was to help people identify the ways that fear shows up as a blocker in their lives and to give them the tools to live more fearlessly. It's about turning the small moments in our lives into big outcomes. Fearless at Work is available for pre-order today. Get your copy now on Amazon or visit mollyfletcher.com for more information. Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Today's guest has been called one of the top 10 minds in small business by Fortune. Known simply as the growth guy, Vern Harnish is founder of the world-renowned Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, with over 11,000 members worldwide. A founder and CEO of Gazelles, a global executive education and coaching company with over 180 partners in six continents, Vern has spent the past three decades helping companies grow. Today, over 40,000 organizations use his firm's tools and techniques to scale. He's the author of the bestseller, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits and Scaling Up. Outside of his business expertise, Vern enjoys piano, tennis, and magic as a card-carrying member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. He joins us today to talk about how to scale your business, the common barriers to growth, and his biggest influences. You can soak up all his knowledge by following at Agile Scale Up on Twitter. All the way from Barcelona, where he lives, welcome Vern Harnish. So Vern Harnish, what a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so, so much for taking time. You know, you've been called the growth guy, and uh, I love that term and have admired and used all your stuff, by the way, for years. But tell me this real quick before we get started. What what kind of inspired you to, to in many ways, dedicate your career to helping entrepreneurs grow their businesses? Well, my grandparents each had companies, Molly, uh, my dad then with some partners that spun out of Martin Marietta, launched a company called Higher Electronics, and they, they scaled it rapidly. And then they lost it in the 73 recession. And it was quite devastating to our family and even my own psyche as a 15-year-old as we moved from little Colorado and wealthy out to Kinsley, Kansas, and not so wealthy. And so I said, you know what, it really ended up uh, hurting my dad, uh, who, by the way, passed away uh, in 2016. Mm. And I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try to do what I can to keep that from happening uh, to other entrepreneurs. And so it's been a life mission. Uh, this is the 30, what are we at, 35th year. Wow. Uh, just swinging at the fences, trying to help entrepreneurs. Because the issue is, you know, there's lots of startups, 11,000, I mean, 11,000 startups an hour in the world. So we're not hurting for startups. Uh, what we really need are the scale-ups. And it's the companies that scale that are really the, the engines of economy. So there's also something very missional about the importance of having this healthy middle class is the conversation right now going on in the United States, and that requires a really healthy middle class of companies. And they actually generated 92% of the jobs since the recession. Oh, my God. Wow. Uh, during the entire Obama administration, they're the ones that did the heavy lifting, why the large companies continue to shed millions of jobs. And you read about it every day. Mm-hmm. And small business, they generate... Uh, as many jobs as they lose. So they just churn and burn, which is okay. You need a lot of that activity uh, down at the bottom to see who's going to win to scale up. But at the end of the day, it's the mid-market that uh, has always bolstered our economy. And that's critical for everyone. Well, and it's interesting that your purpose, I'm a big believer in, in our growth comes by aligning it with our purpose in life. And it and it sounds as if your purpose is so clear and deeply rooted in your in your heart and your soul. And I'm sure 
tell me a little bit about what what that has done as it as it relates to your ability to stay focused and your ability to grow the businesses that you support. Well, you know, though at the same time, I'm a big Cal Newport fan. You know, Cal, we had him at our last uh, Fortune Summit, and he was the first to say, "But this whole follow your passion thing, you got to be careful of," mm-hmm. because a lot of people don't know what that is. And I can't say that when I'm coming out of college that 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 was front and center. It was more about a lucky situation. I thought I was going to go into the nuclear Navy and I'm a mechanical engineer and I was going to go into solar and all kinds of things. And I was recruited away by a top entrepreneurship professor who says, hey, why don't you come join me and 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 let's build a center for entrepreneurship at Wichita State. And, and then I found out I really loved it. And that was Cal's point. You just mm-hmm. start doing stuff. And then all of a sudden you find that, you know what? You're pretty good at it, and you're enjoying it, and then all of a sudden, that's what makes you passionate about it. So I think there's a kind of a chicken and egg there sure. that everyone has to be careful about. Otherwise, you go nuts. You're right. sitting around saying, I'm not passionate about anything, so you're stuck. Yeah, well, yeah. And so I think you really have to just start doing. Amen. I agree with that totally. That is... um. That's cool to uh, to hear you say that. Tell me this, right before we went on, you know, you were talking a little bit about about the difference between managers and, and, and that we don't need managers more, right? We need our managers to be coaches. Tell me more about that. And I love that line, that saying, that belief. Well, I'm working right now on my, my top five trends for 2017 column. We literally have to wrap it up uh, today because it's going into the next issue. But I put one out similarly for 2016 and in there, one of the five and uh, predictions. And I think it began to really happen last year is that, you know, I if the real practical thing, it's time to get rid of the word, the term manager uh, throughout organizations. Nobody needs a manager. Nobody wants to be managed. Uh, the reality is, is that data has replaced management. You know, our phone is what manages my day and manages me, uh, what we used to need, you know, people for. And so we don't need a sales manager, but what we badly need is a sales coach. Uh, and what, what all people need, no one's ever achieved peak performance, Molly, without a coach, as we just sure. witnessed in the Olympics and sure. all of the sports that are going on constantly. And so that's the, that's the, the pivot. So We've defi- got to move from the old management techniques to coaching. So, so Vern, for, for me and for our listeners, tell me, how do you define coach in the corporate world. So if I'm listening and I'm a leader and I want to make this shift that you're suggesting, which is terrific, how, how, do, how would you define that? How does a leader show up every day and behave like a coach rather than a manager? You know, the, the, the short of it is, is to understand with that person they're coaching, what is the goal they want to achieve? And clearly they want to coach them to pick a goal that's going to align with where the company's going and it matches their strengths. That's the old Marcus Buckingham, you know, strengths uh, idea. And then what great coaches do is they pick one thing that they're going to help you get better at. Not five. If you've ever had a bad tennis lesson or a bad golf lesson where, you know, your instructor is telling you 10 things to do, uh, that's not what you want. And so they've got to have enough experience and insight to observe uh, you in action and then say, look, you just need to tweak this for the next few weeks and then let's check back in. And when you're looking at that as kind of the role, you can get much bigger spans of control. You know, right now there's typically kind of a seven to one or 10 to one uh, manager to employee ratio. But if it's more the role of a coach, like my wife just got back from her twice week, you know, training. Um, you can you can get somewhere close to a say a twenty uh, to twenty five span of control because uh, you may only need to really spend you know an hour on average a week. And and obviously this backs into making sure you're hiring the right kind of people, right? That can that that can be coached versus managed, correct? Correct. And we, we're, in fact, we're finishing up a book right now on that. And we've aligned with Jim Collins and Pat Lanchoni that, you know, we think you need to hire based on four criteria in this order. The first is will, you know, 
do they have the will to want to achieve, to get better, uh, to do a great job? Uh, that's the tough one. But if someone doesn't have that will, they've never tasted success, tough to coach that in. Then, number two, you've got to be able to align with the values of the organization. Uh, and that we can, we can top grade interview for. Number three, then, is can they actually get results? And that's really looking at past uh, history and see if there's a pattern of this person, whatever it is that they grab a hold of, even things in high school. And we're able to not only achieve but super achieve uh, in that. And then last is skill. And that's the thing that's most fungible uh, because our skills are changed. The need for our skills to update has become much more rapid. There's some fundamental skills you need about just how to deal with people. Um, and, but again, you can get coached on those things. So will, values, results, and then skill. Yet <clears throat> we have a tendency to write job descriptions and interview in just the opposite order, mm-hmm. starting with, well, here are the skills that is required for this job, and that's what we're looking for. Well, I can't wait for this book to come out. Do you have a uh, title for it and a release date? Um. Well, we it's it's the twelve habits of valuable employees. That's the working title. We're not we have got it, got it, yet. Got it. but it's twelve things that make. We always talk about what you need to be, what you need to do, and be to be a great leader. But I don't think anyone really talks enough about. And Pat Lanchoni had a breakthrough book this last year, The Ideal Team Player. What do you have to do to be a great employee, a great team member? And so we're going to we're going to expand on that uh, topic. And I would imagine the word coach is much more palatable to our younger generation or younger workers or younger teammates, if you will, than than the word manager or millenniums and millennials, et cetera. Um, You know what? We've we've tested it across the board. And, um, you know, as long as you are coachable, and there are, there's a lot of folks that have become hardened, no matter what age they are, to listening, improving, wanting to learn, uh, something Mark Cuban's always really pushed hard on. Um, and so it's more of a mindset that if you think you know it all already, it's going to be tough to be coached. <laughs> and great coaches in sport recognize that when they've got one of those kind of players. Sure. Sure. Uh, we've seen a couple of them this last football season. <laughs> so, so Vern, you know, you've worked with a lot of incredible leaders and companies. And, and what, what would you say are some of the commonalities you see that makes them successful? Well, you know, the first one is this thirst to learn. You know, in my second book, Greatest Business Decisions, we highlighted Bill Gates' Think Week. You know, Bill understood that nothing interesting could come out of that operating system upstairs that you didn't put in first. You know, and his record was 112 books, manuscripts, PhD thesis he absorbed in a seven-day think week period. So he did that twice a year. You know, Mark Zuckerberg started a habit last year of reading a book uh, every two weeks. Uh, Mark Cuban has always read since he was 23 hours every single day, just looking for one idea. To help his, you know, 155 companies he's invested in or owns. And I loved last year, you know, Warren Buffett and team celebrated their 50th anniversary at Berkshire Hathaway. And they asked his partner, uh, Charlie Munger, all right, what's the key to Warren's success? He's crushed the market by a factor of mm-hmm. 10. And Charlie is super insightful, didn't even hesitate. He goes, look, it's always been Warren's first priority to set aside much, you know, a lot of time for quiet reading and thinking. Uh, even as an advanced age, he, he consumes about 500 pages a day. And I don't care whether you read or listen or watch YouTube videos or, or what is your mode, but the pattern is clear that leaders are readers. Uh, they're learners. Uh, last example, so Alan Murray, our editor at Fortune, was interviewing Larry Page. You know, he's taken over as CEO of Google. And, and Alan asked him a very straightforward question. All right, Larry, how have you learned to be a CEO? And he looked at Alan. He goes, I read a lot. You know, even when they went to go name, you know, get the new name for Google Alphabet, he said, I just read three books on how to name. And so there's, there's a real fact pattern there, Molly. 
and it, you know, leaders are learners. Leaders are learners. I'm absolutely, I love that line. What What do you see are some of the most common barriers to growth, right? Besides sort of the inverse of that, obviously. What What are some of the common barriers you see? Well, the number one functional barrier in a practical sense is marketing. You know, do you have a well-functioning, well-oiled marketing department separate from sales? And this generally reporting right to the CEO. I, I don't think it was by accident the only function that Steve Jobs chaired was the marketing function. You know, it was a three-hour meeting every Wednesday afternoon. He, he let Tim Cook run with everything else. And so we see that as a starting point, uh, is making sure that that's well-functioning. And the key activity was something that Regis McKenna, uh, the marketing guru who coached Steve Jobs and, and Andy Grove at Intel and everybody at, uh, throughout Silicon Valley, and me. I called him up when I was a student, Wichita State, said, hey, I want to build this global entrepreneurship organization. And you're helping Steve. Could you help me? And he did. And it was all about set up a one-hour marketing meeting and really focus on the influencers. Take a piece of paper out. And we recommend, And Bill Gates considered the best question he'd ever been asked is take a piece of paper out and write down a list of all the people that you need to get on your side and in order to scale this venture. So we were working on a carbon credit space company last year, and when we took the piece of paper out, it was clear. Al Gore, if you could get Al Gore on board to invest in, put his arm around the entrepreneur, just walk him through Davos, which is going on right now, you've, you've done a lot. And so it's making the list and then, and then working it. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and gal, I mean, Vern, that is such insightful stuff. And, and, and when you, so if you think about, you know, there's people listening, right, that they've, they've started to build a business, you know, maybe they're bootstrapping a little bit, they're one or two guys or gals, and they're continuing to grow, maybe they're at a million bucks, you know, maybe they're growing. Um, what, how do they know what the next move is, right? I mean, is it a product? Is it more services? What have you seen as the trends there? And what advice would you give somebody in that spot? Well, you know, in that very beginning, uh, you know, first, really, our first advice is take a piece of paper out. I want to launch the student entrepreneurship group. I mean, it's day one. I take a piece of paper out and said, all right. And I was young and dumb. I said, I want President Ronald Reagan to talk about this. And I want to get Steve Jobs involved and Michael Dell. And I mean, I swung for the fences. Mm -hmm. And 36 months later, we had all those folks on board. And we were global that quick. When you get the right person, to, uh, it's like going on Shark Tank and getting one of those judges to say what well, you've got's great, and they choose to invest in you, and the rest is history. You, you've got you've got some momentum, and then the key look. It's hard, but in the very beginning, you've got to just sell like hell. <laughs> you know, it's you, you know Michael Masterson wrote a great book from zero to a hundred million, and he said the biggest mistake the folks in the beginning make is they get all caught up in how does their logo look and how do their business cards look and do we get the website right? No, you just got to get out there and sell. Yeah, do whoever you can, get to that first million, and then you can start thinking about some of this other stuff. And then third, you got to just, in the beginning, you got to say yes to everything. And then the key is when you cross that chasm from being a lean startup to what we call an agile scale-up, now you've got to start to laser focus. You got to pick one thing, one product, one service that you have figured out you can you're really good at, can make a lot of money at, and then you take that to a narrow group of customers in the marketplace and you win in that niche. And that's hard to do because, you know, in the beginning you just took anything you could and it's hard to break that habit. Yeah, absolutely. Right. No question. What, what do you see as some of the, in addition to being learners, right, in addition to reading and consuming an enormous amount of content, what are some of the things you see great leaders do as it relates to daily habits? Well, that's where we, you know, that's where Mastering the Rockefeller Habits came about. And, and I used as the role model John D. Rockefeller, who built the, he became the wealthiest guy on the planet, I guess next to Putin, uh, as, we're to, as we're discovering. Uh, that's supposed to be a joke, Molly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I got it. I got it. I wanted to make but, sure that's where you were but, going. <laughs> but the fundamental is this daily huddle. 
you know, John D. Rockefeller would walk to work each day and walk home each day with his brother and his couple of buddies. And that was that walk and talk time where they really figured out what needed to be done. It wasn't the intervening eight to 10 hours when they were pounding it hard, you know, at their desk. And when he moved then from Cleveland to New York, even though the inner circle changed, he made sure they lived near enough to each other so they could continue to walk to work and walk home. And he then set up this kind of daily uh, luncheon with his nine directors. You speed forward 100 years, and the fundamental routine that uh, Steve Jobs is involved in that drove Apple's success is obviously it was design, and so he had lunch almost every day with Jonathan Ive and the design team. We just hosted General McChrystal, who was the guy that really turned things around for us in Iraq, and he's written a great book called Team of Teams. And at the heart of it is they set up a daily uh, briefing, not just for the top generals, but for all 7,000 special ops uh, teams. Wow. So they could rapidly communicate what they'd learned the last 24 hours and the 30 raids that they had just conducted. Uh, Because they were facing an enemy that is using social media like Donald Trump, you know, to move fast and win big. Mm -hmm. And so this, at the heart of this, you know, success, T. Boone Pickens, who took 3.2 million and turned it into 4 billion in six years. At the heart of it is a daily meeting that he put in place with the key people and got this this critical talk time. So that's the key habit. The second one is being able to, you know, clear your mind and be laser focused on not the five, not the three, but the one thing that you absolutely have to get done today amongst all the rest of the noise. And what is that thing for the next week? You know, Google calls them sprints. Uh, those are two weeks in some companies. They do mm-hmm. it in five days. What are we going to do this quarter? Mark Zuckerberg's been brilliant at it at Facebook. And what do we have to do this year? And keep everybody aligned and focused. And so I think knowing what's number one and then communicating incessantly about it and the daily huddle helps that are two of the key. Routine. Well, and, and, you know, Vern, I think a lot of your growth tools on, you know, I use all of them for my business, all of them. They're amazing. I think they're fantastic. And so what you're talking about, I think for the listeners, those strategic planning documents, I think are terrific. In addition to if they have the budget to have to hire you and your gazelles team folks to come in and support them. Tell me. Well, that comes back to no one's uh-huh. ever achieved peak performance without a coach. And I think what's interesting, I'm seeing traction on that in a big way. Um, people's attitude that, you know, a coach must mean I'm weak as opposed to this is probably one of the best corporate perks you could get. And, and again, Steve Jobs and Eric Schmidt and most of the folks in Silicon Valley have got coaches. And it was Bill Campbell, rest his soul, who passed away a few months that was the, the top coach there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So am I hearing you say that for, for leaders or anyone in a corporate environment, having a coach at some level is, 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 is money well spent? You bet. And as you see, you know, the great athletes, or you just saw the kick off the Australian Open, hope it's not dating this podcast, but, you know, those great, the great tennis players have got multiple coaches. You know, they got the, the one that's helping get their head right, the one that's getting their stroke right, the one that's getting their serve right. And so you need a guru of support, a village of support, mm-hmm. um, in order to really, uh, you know, help you achieve that which you think you can achieve. It's one of the reasons why, you know, early on, just putting together an informal advisory board, as some folks that you can bounce things off of. My wife has just launched an olive oil business. She's, you know, uh, sad about the, you know all the bad olive oil that's been kind of. Uh, you know, put upon or thrust upon the Americans versus what we get over here in Europe. And she's right away amassing kind of a support team. In fact, she's got a friend who's coaching her and another one who's helping with marketing. And and she knows it's a team process. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Lone Ranger uh, model of getting things done is is kind of last century. Mm-hmm. Well, and she's living with a pretty great guy that knows how to uh, grow businesses. <laughs> yeah, husbands <laughs> coaching their wives. That's a. You don't recommend that? that? 
<laughs> we, uh, hey, uh, you know, she's been very open to it, so I appreciate it, but uh, I have to be careful. Well, you know what it is? It's like playing doubles with your husband. You know what I mean? That, yep. that, that can oh get interesting. Oh, my gosh. She's a massive tennis player. Okay. And that is one of our rules. We right. Do not play doubles together. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. So, um, what what are some of your favorite books? You've rattled off a couple. We've gotten all those, which is awesome. That you'd tell entrepreneurs listening to read, or or any kind of business person that's listening to read. Well, a couple of resources. I list forty of them. The kind of ten in each of the people, strategy, execution, and cash. Uh, my fortune column. I name then what I consider the five best business books each year. Uh, but I have five that are kind of overall, and I put number one, Eli Golrat's book, The Goal. You know, it was one of the first to be a parable, and he really described a key skill, and that is to identify the constraint. Uh, you know, you got a thousand things to do, but if you can't figure out that front domino of the thousand dominoes, you've got to knock over the thing that's really constraining you moving forward next. Uh, then you're going to waste a lot of time and energy. And so that's how you, in reverse, answer that question that you said is, hey, how do you decide the next step? And you look at the situation and say, where's the weak link? And I've got to go put my effort there. So Mark Zuckerberg, even though he's getting ready to go public, if they didn't get mobile, nothing else mattered. And he did. Yahoo didn't. And the rest is history. Um, so... It's, it's understanding what's in your way next and getting that rock out of the way as you head up the mountain. Wow. That's awesome. So we can go to Gazelles and, and, and pull that list then. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. The other book that I, 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 I almost want to take it upon you know, a personal mission of mine because I'm such a raving fan of Jim Collins is his last book, Great by Choice. You know, when I look at the Amazon rankings, it ought to be by far his number one book. Uh, it's his last, in my view, his most brilliant and most applicable to us mere mortals, uh, from startup to mid market on up to large companies. And his chapter on return on luck, because we all know about half our success is luck. And it's, it's not whether you have good luck or bad luck, it's what you do with it. And, and the insights in that chapter have made me more money than any other thing I've ever learned. And so wow. great by choice, great by choice, I think is, is it's in the top five as well. Well, I'm going to, I do not have that book yet. I'm going to get on it right now. I'm on it. It sounds Good. like it's amazing. It, it sounds is. terrific. And I'm a big fan of Jim Cowan's stuff. As Linciona, you mentioned him. I read all his stuff and have met him. On, I've been honored to meet him. He's a wonderful man. Yeah, his five dysfunctions of a oh. team is is in that top five as well. Absolutely, and we were lucky just to host him with his new book. A Good few for months you. Ago. Oh wow. Well, listen, I I want to wrap with something that we always do, and it's rapid fire questions. So right. it's sort of fun, um, and I just need you to blurt out what comes to mind, what you feel good about. Just fire it, and I'm going to just blow through, through these real quick, and then we'll wrap. Okay. Oh my gosh, this is scary. It's late at you night. Got I'm it. tired. I'm hungry. That's so okay. Go, go get go. some, uh, right. get a little, they've got good wine over there, Vern. They do. Uh, yeah. Two, the wine's too good. I bet. I bet. Okay. One word to describe yourself. Independent. Childhood idol. Napoleon Hill. Biggest fear. Not save, not doing everything I can to save the planet. Favorite off day activity. Uh, the new one's paddle. Not paddle yeah, tennis, like yeah. paddle. Nice. Yeah, it's it's a small. It's kind of cross between tennis and handball, and, and it's absolutely a blast. We've been playing it with family. Hidden talent. Um, I'm a card carrying member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. I read that. Get back so, at it. Yeah. I love that. I read that. That's a uh, very cool. Favorite perk of your job? Reading, learning. I'm, I'm head of R and D. For our a person who's had the biggest impact on your life. Uh, it was my mentor, Fran Jabera. He, he kind of taught me most of what I, I teach today. Wow. And your biggest pet peeve? Unfinished business. <laughs> like companies that don't scale up? <laughs> yeah, you can, you can throw that in as 
part of unfinished business <laughs> in all aspects. One thing that you cannot live without. It's so cliche, but love, man. Nice. That's awesome. No, that's tr- so authentic and cool. So what is, you know, you just told me before we came on that you took a trip around the world with your family. And so let me ask you this one. What's your favorite place to visit? Barcelona, which is why we live here. Uh, But also Antigua, Guatemala. Neat. Wonderful. Yes. Well, you did great on the rapid fire. You know, those are... uh, tough and good and fast. So thanks so much. Vern, so I go to your website, I'd say a couple times a month, but tell our listeners, where can they find out more about you and how can they access some of your tools and and awesome resources? They can just go to scalingup.com. And we even have our one page personal plan up there for free and the chapter that supports it. So lots of free stuff to help the company again, scalingup.com. Thanks as always for listening. And if you missed an episode, you can listen to previous episodes on iTunes or on mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be a game changer.